Here's what's ahead on this week's Investing Insights. Warren Buffett's portfolio took a hit. What Morningstar thinks about Berkshire Hathaway. Plus, one of the world's biggest chip makers is cutting his quarterly dividend. And how investors can benefit from the rising popularity of AI chatbots. Research from Morningstar's team will explain how. This is Investing Insights. Welcome to Investing Insights. I'm your host, Ivana Hampton, and let's kick it off with a look at the Morningstar headlines. Market volatility rocked. The Oracle Omaha's portfolio. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway reported solid operating revenue that offset unrealized losses from investments, and the results from the company's latest earnings report lined up with Morningstar's expectations. But its full-year revenue dropped about a third in 2022, and fourth-quarter revenue also fell, due to weaker investment portfolio performance. And that includes the gains and losses of the holding company's investments and derivative portfolios. Morningstar figures Berkshire entered 2023 with about $94 billion in cash that it could use for investments, acquisitions, or share buybacks. Morningstar doesn't expect to change its estimate of the share's worth and views the stock as undervalued. Domino's has cut its sales growth and unit development outlook for the next two to three years, the pizza chain's lower expectations validate Morningstar's belief that worsening restaurant profitability and higher construction and financing costs would hurt most of its store operators' unit development for some time. Domino's quarterly results were mixed. The company's almost $1.4 billion in sales was in line with Morningstar's forecast, but earnings per share fell slightly short of expectations. Strong cost controls and gradual growth from refranchising dozens of stores should help operating margins in 2023. Inflation and customers' reluctance to pay higher prices should make this year challenging for restaurant owners. Domino's carryout business remains its key growth engine. The pizza chain remains Morningstar's top restaurant industry pick, with an estimated stock worth of $397. Intel is cutting its quarterly dividend by two-thirds. Weak demand for personal computers and strong pressure from rival Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD, have hurt the chipmaker. Morningstar supports Intel's integrated device manufacturing strategy, known as IDM 2.0. The dividend cut is necessary, given the capital expenditure requirements of Intel's turnaround plan. Its dividend yield surpassed 5% before the cut. That would have been tough to maintain. Morningstar estimates at least $20 billion in capital expenditures for Intel this year. The chipmaker's dividend payouts are better served investing in new technologies and research and development. Intel expects to save billions through the end of 2025 through layoffs, marketing cuts, and temporary salary reductions. And these actions could lead to underinvesting in key areas and losing top talent. Morningstar still thinks Intel's stock is worth $35 and undervalued. However, competitor AMD looks like the better option since it's expected to perform better despite the softer macroeconomic conditions. The popularity of an AI-powered chatbot known as ChatGPT is surging. It's delivering human-like responses and sometimes is making headlines for them. The chatbot's arrival also seems to have intensified the clash between two tech titans, and you might be wondering how to invest in AI technology. Morningstar Inc.'s data journalist Jakir Hussein has talked with Morningstar analysts about that. And Jakir is joining Investing Insights. Jakir, OpenAI created ChatGPT. Um, it has potentially kicked off an AR arms race. And this thing has gone viral. Let's start off with what ChatGPT is and how does it work? Yeah, so ChatGPT is an artificial intelligent language model, which is just the fancy term to explain that it takes in a lot of data and analyzes that data. Uh, in order to figure out the relationship between words so that it can understand how to then respond to a user prompt in the most logical um, and sensical way that it's capable of. And so with ChatGPT, you can ask it a question and it'll look back at all the data sets that it's been trained on and try to figure out what's a suitable response to that. Now, Microsoft has announced that it's going to invest billions of dollars in open AI. And then Google followed up and unveiled its own chatbot, Bard AI. What do Morningstar analysts say about how these companies are going to use these chatbots? Yeah, so in our in my conversation with some of our technology analysts, right now, Google and Microsoft are kind of in the center 
uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence, largely because of Microsoft's stakes and o- stake in OpenAI um, and Google uh, developing their own Bard AI, as you mentioned. Both of these are companies I own, um, and so I've been keeping a close eye to see like how they've been incorporating this technology into their products and services. And right now, it's really just been focused on integrating it uh, with search to try and make that better and in basically kind of make their search engines a lot more competitive um, and engaging to users. So for example, Microsoft has released a uh, public beta of sorts uh, where their search engine Bing is now being powered by AI and you can interact it in the same way that you can with the chat GPT research platform. Uh, Google hasn't quite yet done the same, but I wouldn't be surprised if they put that out eventually. Um, and so, you know, the focus, the question between these two companies right now is like, is Microsoft going to be able to kind of uh, challenge Google in the search market uh, because Google dominates that field? Um, like, what are the, how are, if our dynamics going to change, how are they going to change? Those are kind of the big questions that investors are facing when it comes to those two in AI right now. Okay. So companies like Salesforce and Adobe, they're also using AI. Can you describe how they're doing it? Yeah, so similar to Google and Microsoft, um, Adobe and Salesforce, and Salesforce is another company that I own, um, they're mostly using artificial intelligence in order to like enhance their existing products and features. And so, for example, Adobe um, has this uh, AI that you know they call Adobe Sensei, and that's kind of like been weaved into a lot of uh, programs like Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Illustrator. And the purpose behind it is to kind of help users um, automate some of the more like monotonous tasks that they have to do when using uh, programs like Photoshop. So for example, like uh, for somebody who's trying to edit a photo, let's say you wanted to remove something from a digital image um, because uh, somebody photobombed your picture or something like that. Um, You can remove it, but it's going to leave a gap there. And so Adobe Sensei can kind of help uh, the editor figure out like it's basically going to analyze the entire picture and figure out like okay what's a suitable color or texture or background to fill this gap up with so that the picture looks natural and it's using ai to power that future like why salesforce has um their ai platform is called salesforce einstein and you know that's uh dedicated to providing users uh more features that allow them to kind of predict if they're going to be able to convert uh a, le- a sales lead into an, a reoccurring customer, figure out what's the probability of being able to like bring a customer, purchase a higher tier of whatever product or service they're trying to sell, as well as like um, optimize um, search results uh, for customers to, you know, uh, expose them to products that they might be interested in. Okay, so artificial intelligence has been around for some time. What are some thoughts within Morningstar about this new phase of AI? Yeah, so in my conversation, um, like we've kind of thought that artificial intelligence is something like we've actually had for quite some time. Um, like I think, uh, or, you know, our analysts say that products like Siri, Alexa, and even Google Search, which has to this day, um, over the last few years, really has been using artificial intelligence to help power its search results. Um, like we've been using AI in a much more subtle way, um, but right now, like with the uh, release of like chat GPT and like the announcement of like Bard AI, uh, we're entering kind of, we're entering like a new sort of era where artificial intelligence is a lot more interactable in that, you know, with chat GPT, you can type in a response and get a human like response back. Like users can actually interact with AI in ways that they haven't been able to with like Siri and Alexa uh, to the same degree. Um, and so it's exciting. Um, and, but, you know, in talking with their analysts, we think that this is still very much in the first inning. Uh, Chat GPT, Bard AI, these things are exciting, but we really think uh, this technology has gotten started. Uh, so I think we have a lot left to figure out and see what's next. So your article suggested investors focus on suppliers than the companies using AI in their products. What do Morningstar analysts say about how to take advantage of AI technology right now? Yeah, so just to give a bit of background on that, um, so like I mentioned before, artificial intelligence right now, the focus is kind of figuring out a way 
uh, for companies to incorporate it in order to enhance their existing products and services. And so our analysts don't really see a huge revenue opportunity in artificial intelligence just yet, because, you know, like incorporating AI in the case of like Adobe Sensei, that may not necessarily be a new stream of revenue for Adobe. Um, it's going to make their products more compelling and competitive perhaps, but it's not necessarily going to like bring up their sales numbers. And so right now, the field that they've kind of identified as like where most of the money for artificial intelligence from an investing standpoint is going, is going to be in the semiconductor industry. And that's because artificial intelligence requires a lot of advanced computing resources. And the focus and the primary uh, contributor to that is going to be advanced semiconductors known as graphics processing units, GPUs, or sometimes called graphics cards. And there's only really there's three main companies that produce these, which is NVIDIA, another company that I own, AMD, and Intel. Um, and among those three, NVIDIA stands out the most largely because it is you know, producing graphics cards that are the most competitive for AI workloads. And even their latest um, product offering in the data center and AI space, um, they, they release graphics cards under like the Hopper family uh, architecture. Uh, that graphics card is optimized for AI workloads. And so like that's like something that companies looking to build up their own AI infrastructure, they're buying those graphics cards in order to produce that. Um, AMD also, AMD and Intel both do offer graphics cards that can, are capable of helping with AI solutions. Um, but in the case of AMD, although they've been competitive with NVIDIA for at, uh, almost two decades, uh, they only just entered the data center and artificial intelligence space about in 2020. And Intel really just entered the graphics card um, market like very recently. I think they only launched their first graphics card last summer. Um, and so right now, like in terms of opportunities, even within the semiconductor industry, like our analyst sees NVIDIA as like the top pick for people who think, you know, there's going to be a lot of AI spending because, you know, they're producing the most competitive uh, graphics cards for those workloads. Um, but that being said, NVIDIA is also currently fairly valued. So we do not think that uh, if investors are looking to uh, open a position in NVIDIA, right now it is it, the stock is just trading just at fair value. And so they might want to wait until it pulls back a little. AMD and Intel, on the other hand, are undervalued. And so although you know they're not as exposed to AI workloads, um, they do benefit from that trend. And so investors might want to look at that as well. All right, Jakir, thank you for joining me on Investing Insights. Thanks for having me. Be sure to check out Jakir's article, How to Invest in the Right AI Stocks. The link is in the show notes. You can miss out on compounding growth if you make IRA contributions at the last minute. Here's Morningstar Inc.'s Director of Personal Finance, Christine Benz, with Vanguard's Maria Bruno, and they talk about how to avoid the so-called procrastination penalty. Hi, I'm Christine Benz for Morningstar. Some investors rush in their IRA contributions right before the deadline, but that's not necessarily the right course of action. Joining me to discuss some healthy habits for IRA investing is Maria Bruno. She's head of U.S. Wealth Planning Research for Vanguard. Maria, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Christine. Good to be here. Thank you. So let's talk about this issue of investors waiting until the 11th hour to make their IRA contributions, getting them in right before the tax filing deadline. You and I have discussed in the past, Maria, that this is kind of a phenomenon that you see. Is this something that you're continuing to see uh, this year, for example? We do, Christine, but we're seeing some really encouraging trends. Um, again, we're looking at the 2021 tax year, and what we're seeing is that more contributions are coming in early in the tax filing year. So we're seeing actually about 20% of contributions come in as early as January, and that's very encouraging. If we look through to April um, of that year, it's about 20, an additional 20% making contributions early. So that's quite encouraging. Um, that said, we are still seeing an incidence of procrastinators, people who are making that contribution towards that April 15th filing deadline. About 35% of contributions are coming in uh, at the back end. About 15% of those actually are at 
the April timeframe. So we still have more work to do there, but the trends are are highly encouraging. Okay. A couple other things we're seeing is that we're seeing a higher adoption of Roth coming in um, in that early time frame. So it seems like Roth contributors are the early bird contributors, if you will, taking advantage of that tax-free uh, compounding clock. And then we're also seeing um, a higher incidence of investors who are doing multiple contributions throughout that period, whether it's through automatic exchanges or manual contributions. You referenced that um, you're seeing more people spacing out their contributions throughout the year. It seems like that's a good development. Is there anything uh, that Vanguard tries to do to encourage that behavior? Yeah, and Christine, education, first and foremost, is very important for us, right? The more we can talk about and educate uh, investors around the benefit of investing for retirement early, um, you know, we take every opportunity to do that. Um, What we also did, we did a few interesting initiatives last year with some really good results. So, for instance, for the 2021 tax season, we tested out a new IRA dashboard um, during the enrollment process and then also some educational programs. Um, basically just reminding clients to contribute to their IRAs before they, you know, lose that opportunity. And the the results were quite interesting and, and encouraging in that what we found was that clients who received these personal outreaches were actually 17% more likely to contribute. Um, and of these clients that actually did these contributions, we saw a total of about $155 million um, added to their retirement savings. So it's quite exciting and encouraging that we're actually able to help these investors improve their financial situation. Um, Another thing that we're doing right now, now granted we're still in the middle of of tax season, but we're doing more personalized and frequent reminders to investors to take advantage of these retirement savings options. And what we're seeing is those first-time contributors with Vanguard are actually not only making contributions, but making contributions that are 15% higher than those who do not get Um, these personal outreaches. So what we're really focusing here is using data-driven insights to drive better investor outcomes. Um, And the more we can do that, I think the more we can set clients up for investment success, much like our mission and, and in principles employ. Okay, so I wanted to follow up on those stragglers, the people who are rushing in their contributions right before the deadline. Can you talk about the penalty that someone incurs if they're waiting, you know, year after year until the very last minute. At first blush, it doesn't seem like it should be a big deal. But can you talk about how that can translate into some significant uh, compounding, lost opportunities for compounding over time? Yeah, I mean, we we all realize, you know, the sooner you can start the compounding clock, the better, right? But there is, and we're calling this the procrastination penalty, right? There's a cost to waiting, and it doesn't seem like a big deal when you think about it. But let's look at a simple example. Let's assume that we're looking at someone who's making their annual IRA contributions that is $6,500 a year. Let's say they're hypothetically investing in a balanced fund, maybe earning a 4% real return. Over 20 years, it, and again, we're looking at today's dollars. Over 20 years, that amounts to about a $10,000 difference. Over 30 years, it's about $18,000. And that's striking when you're simply talking about the timing difference, of whether you're making a contribution in January or if you're making a contribution 15 months later. Now, this is a very gen- generalized example. I realize that. But even the research that we've done that shows the power of you know early and lump sum type investing in capital markets forecasting just shows the value of compounding early. Um, now, I realize not everyone has the means to be able to make that contribution in January, but but even if you were to set this up automatically and break that $6,500 down over that 15-month period, you know, you're looking at a $400 contribution monthly. So if you can't do it all at once, just having that discipline to be able to do it throughout that period is a very good disciplined way to do that. Right. Makes it much more manageable. I wanted to talk about a related issue here. And this is another thing that you flagged in the past is this issue of people get their contribution in, but then they let it sit in cash or something without a lot of earnings potential because maybe they're not sure where to invest. Can you talk about that dimension of it and and what Vanguard sees in terms of what participants do once they get the contribution into the account? Yeah, no, this is a good one. And we do see procrastination procrastinators who tend to park that money in cash, they tend to be focused more on the act of making that contribution. Maybe it's a a check the box exercise. And what they're doing is decoupling that contribution and investment decision. And while many have the best intention to go back 
and invest that money, they they don't. And we find that it actually sits in cash for months. And there's a big opportunity cost to remaining uninvested. Um, now, it would be great right? if you look at plan sponsors uh, design and how um, plan sponsors can default individuals into a target date fund or a balanced fund. That is a great behavioral tool, but we can't do that directly um, with direct investors. But we should and we we should be able to help them. Uh, avoid some of these pitfalls. And that's very important for us to Vanguard. And I think there's a lot that we can do in terms of not only educating our clients, but making that online experience, that enrollment process much more intuitive so that they can actually easily make that contribution and that investment decision all at once. That's the key to make it easy and intuitive for investors. Just to get it done in one fell swoop. And like you, I I think the target date fund is a great idea for an IRA for people who aren't sure where to put the money, but, you know, they know it's for their retirement. It seems like a really solid option. Right. Absolutely. And just talking about and educating and personalizing that online experience can really go a long way, I think, in educating investors to do that. Um, And then they don't have to go back and do it again. They're well invested. They're diversified, low cost options. It's a great start. Okay, Maria. Helpful as always. Thank you so much for being here to share your insights. Thank you, Christine. Good to be here. Thanks, Christine and Maria. Subscribe to Morningstar's YouTube channel to see new videos about market news, personal finance, and investment picks. Thanks to podcast producer Jake Bankerson. And thank you for tuning in to Investing Insights. I'm your host, Ivana Hampton. I'm a senior multimedia editor here at Morningstar. Take care.